Hey everybody, it's your girl Bunny. It's HBO's original series, Watchmen, starring Regina King. Season one, episode four, entitled, If You Don't Like My Story, Write Your Own. This episode was very exciting, giving us more twists and turns. If you're new to the channel, welcome, and I hope that you subscribe. I do a recap of the entire episode, and at the end, I give my review with some notes. All minute marks will be indicated in the comments. I lost my voice, I'm sorry, bear with me, but we're gonna have fun, sit back and relax as we recap. It's all coming up next. <laughs> it's Bunny. of an egg yolk in the shape of Watchmen. That constant reminder of eggs cracking. It's been mentioned in previous episodes. You need to crack a few eggs to make an omelet. You have to crack a few things to get things going. So it's that constant reminder that the crescendo and energy is continuing to just rise and the tension is continuously rising in tension throughout this series so far. And we're just in episode Four. So after we hear that and we see the word watchman in the shape of a yellow yolk giving us a reminder, eggs, cracking, tension, we see a young woman. She is in a chair. We can see that she's maybe a farmer and we're validated that she is. She's dressed in farmer's clothing. She has a cart next to her that says fresh produce, the best in Tulsa. And we see that she has lots of eggs that she's trying to sell. She's looking into the road as many carts cars pass because she's thinking could this be a potential customers many cars pass and she don't she doesn't have any customers but as the day continues on we hear the music by Dolly Parton I can't think of the name of the song but it's da 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 that is what we are. Can't think of the name of the song, but it's setting the mood that this is such a calm and serene day of, of a farmer trying to sell produce, very relaxed. She's gathering the eggs at the end of the day, gathering them as she trips over the stairs and breaking all of the eggs. And we see the man that she's with, he notices that she falls. And instead of him being angry and upset, he gives her a nice smirk like, oh, mistakes happen. It's a non verbal visual exchange that they have with one another they eat dinner they work on a puzzle for a little while so a very calm just chill couple they brush their teeth together they get in the bed and just as they're about to go to sleep the music and the mood is interrupted by a doom doom at the door and they have a visitor but who could it be and they looked very puzzled into wondering who could be knocking at our door. The gentleman goes to the door and the lady follows behind him and when he opens the door, it's a very short, quaint Asian woman dressed in all white and she asks, are you the Clarks? And he says, what, you're Lady True. She says, yes, I am. May I come in? They invite her in and she proceeds to sit down on the couch and Lady True asks, what have you heard about me? And the woman, she can't wait to just jump in and say, well, yeah, you're Lady True. You're this billionaire. You're making this real big clock here and you've been making it for the past couple of years and nobody ever sees you because, well, you, you don't come out. And Lady True says, well, actually I'm a trillionaire and I do come out, but only when it's necessary. And I wanted to let you know that for the next three minutes, you two are the most important people in the world. And she pulls out a sand clock and proceeds to turn it over to start the time. And the time starts. And she says, well, I wanted to let you know that I want this land. I want your house and also the 40 acres that it sits on. And as the woman is very reluctant to say, well, no, you can't have it. She says, well, let me remind you of something. Everyone has a legacy, and this house, this land that you have, it's been handed to you because of legacy. Someone handed it down to one person, and then they handed it down to that person, and then now it's been handed down to you. But you don't have a legacy. You don't have children. When you die, 
Where does this home in this land go? I also know that you and your husband have tried to have a child, but you had no luck with that. And that's bad news. But I want to let you know that I can give you a child. And it's something that you don't have to grow or something that you don't have to do because I already have that child and it's biologically yours. I offer you legacy. I've placed $5 million in an account for not only your relocation, but for college fees, baby food, you know, all that kind of stuff. You have a short amount of time to decide, so I need you to make your decision very quickly. And if you don't decide, then I'll make sure that I destroy the child. Oh, I'm kidding. I won't destroy the child. I'll make sure that the child goes to someone else. But you'll never know the child's location. Make up your mind very quickly. Because this is something that I really need to know. And the couple is just in shock. They don't know what to do. You can see that their eyes are filled with tears and that they're very eager to have this child. They're very eager to move forward. And Lady True adds the sprinkles on the top to say, would you like to hold him? The baby has your eyes. And she's saying things that are further enticing them to say, wow, this is an offer that we can't refuse. And the lady is just so excited and perplexed about what to do that she rushes to the pay paperwork that Lady True has on the table and they sign it. All of a sudden, they feel a brief earthquake and they see lights flash and they rush to the front door and they see something kind of catapult through the sky and gives this brief crash on the land. And the gentleman says, what is that? And Lady True says, that is mine. Meanwhile, Angela, she's at her bakery trying to dismember and get rid of any proof that she can that Will was actually present at the bakery. She's wiping down surfaces. She's taking away the eggs that he was eating and breaking the shells. Everything she's sawing down and breaking apart his wheelchair. She's placing it in a bag to get rid of that. And as she's doing it, she stops briefly and she picks up the pamphlet that Will dropped down to her in the last episode before he was taken away. And she reads it, and as she's looking at it, she hears the voicemail message from the Greenwood Center of Cultural Heritage, and it says, Will, you have more information concerning your family tree. Another person has been added to this tree and as she's listening to it she accidentally starts to burn the pamphlet from the stove and she's trying to stomp it out and get rid of it and she collects her thoughts and she starts to think and we are already know that maybe Angela is making her way to get back to the center because she's just received this voicemail. Angela, she gets suited up and booted up because she is on a mission. She puts on the mask, she puts on the uniform, and as she walks out, she makes a call on her cell phone to the precinct and says, hey, did you get any alerts or silent alarms that tripped up for the Greenwood Center? They say, well, no, well, what's the problem? She says, I noticed that there's a broken window on the side. So if you hear the alarm, don't get tripped up or send any alerts about it. Don't send anyone out. It's just me checking out the premises. And they say, okay, and they give her the green light. But she needs this in order to break in. So of course she lied because she's thinking of some way to do it. She walks up to the building, she breaks the window, and she walks in because she is on a mission, okay? She goes back to the kiosk where people can inquire about their ancestry. And as she goes up to the kiosk, instead of giving Will's name, she gives her name. Angela Abar and she wants to know about this addition and she wants to know about her family tree. The kiosk then gives her this acorn and says go to the acorn center where you can find out about your family tree. She retrieves the acorn and she goes to that area and she drops it into this area where she can see her family tree. She then sees this hologram of what is her family tree and it's walking her around and all of the branches are starting to spread and then it goes into this new addition that has been added to the tree that she can visually 
see. It then goes on to describe her great grandfather and who he is and his wife and who that is. It explains that her great grandfather is Obi Williams and he is an individual that went to fight in the war. And his wife is, let me get the name, is Ruth Robinson and they have a son. And it's showing the sun, but the information about the sun is not in the records. It's something that they haven't retrieved. And the parents, unfortunately, it describes that they were murdered in the massacre. And Angela, instead of being excited about the news, she's angry. And she looks at the vision of the sun on the hologram and says, I don't know who you are. I don't know where you are. But in other words, don't rock my world with whoever you are. Don't try to find me. She doesn't want this person to sway or change anything in her lifestyle. So she's very determined that this person not mess up her world. And whoever he is, wherever he is, he better stay there because she has this vendetta to make it to where nothing disrupts that. While Angela is having this moment, she hears this very large crash and car alarm start to go off so she runs outside to see what it is and we notice that it's the same scene that we ended on when agent blake was standing there and sees this car fall out of the sky so it's this simultaneous thing that happens in that moment and angela goes into her pocket to cut off the car alarm and agent blake says this is your car she says yeah she goes into the car to check the glove compartment and Agent Blake says, anything missing? Kind of giving her that idea of, wow, you're searching the car already. And Angela says, no, you know, everything's fine. And Agent Blake can't believe that, wow, this is your car. Because remember, the last time that she saw her car, the last time Angela saw it, was when Will was taken up in it and just kind of just vanished into the sky. And Angela was like, what the crap? What just happened? So we see this mysterious moment has happened. And Agent Blake says, wow, it just, just fell from the sky. And Angela's just like, really? She's like, yeah, it just, just fell from the sky. Kind of weird, huh? Angela, she has those pills and she takes it home with her. And when she goes home, she notices that Cal and the two girls are asleep in their bedroom. So she goes to one of the kids' rooms and they have a bunk bed and she takes the bottom bunk. And we see that Topher is on the top bunk. And he says, well, you know, they were asleep, huh? And Angela says, well, yeah, I needed somewhere to crash. The girls and Cal are sleeping there. And Topher says, you know, I didn't see, I didn't see that man get shot in the head. And Angela says, yeah, you did see that. You saw it. And Topher says, you know, when I heard that ticking and when you saved everybody, were you scared? And Angela reiterates, yeah, I, I was scared. I was very scared. And Topher says, that's interesting. And Angela lets him know. I was scared and I'm actually still scared right now. And we see this cute stuffed animal hanging on the side of the bed. And Topher gives her that to say, you know, hold on to that stuffed an animal. And Angela gives that cute little laugh like, wow, thanks. And she holds the stuffed animal and she tries to get some sleep. The next day, Angela has a very brief conversation with Cal and Cal is asking several questions. Where were you? What was this? What happened in this situation? Which as a viewer is very suspicious because he's constantly asking about not only her whereabouts, but detail. So that's kind of a red flag to me and a huge clue about Cal. But she then goes to visit Looking Glass. And when she visits Looking Glass, he is processing photos of stills that he's taken of Squid. And Angela tells him, you know, I need you to ask your ex can they process these pills and find out what they are? And he says, well, why didn't you take these to the precinct? And she says, I have my reasons. And I just really need you to ask your ex. I know it's going to be hard, but I need to figure out what these pills are. And he says, well, okay, you know, let's see what I can do. And then she proceeds to pull out 
the KKK uniform and says, this was in Judd's closet. And Looking Glass cuts her off and says, well, I'm guessing that you're giving this to me because you don't want the FBI agent to know that you have it. Is that right? She says, well, yeah, I don't want her to know. And I don't want her to know about the pills either. He says, okay. And Looking Glass doesn't seem too shocked about this discovery of this uniform in his house. He seems very cool, calm, and collected, um, maybe from previous experience. Maybe nothing surprises him, and he has this tone of not trusting anybody, so he's just like, you know, well, okay, I'll keep it. And he finds it very interesting that the KKK uniform, he's like, whoa, this is old school. This is a very throwback uniform. And I'll keep it, and I'll make sure I find out about those pills. Angela goes to this bridge with the bag of all of the parts of Will's wheelchair, and she throws it over the bridge, and it lands in this truck where I guess they throw things away. And as she's standing there, she feels a presence, and she looks over her shoulder, and she's being watched by someone that looks like they're in an alien costume. And Angela's just like, what the, f you know? And as she goes to ask who this is, the person just starts to run and take off. And she's like, whoa, 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 please stop. And she's chasing them and chasing them. And as the person is running, they go to a belt that they have and they pull out all these little canisters of oil and they spray themselves down with it and they slide down into the sewer and they disappear. And then just like, what the heck, man? She's like, what the just happened? And so she takes that belt that that person let go and she goes to the precinct. And as she goes to the precinct and gets off the elevator, she notices that the senator is there. And he's smiling and he's just like, oh, well, hello, Angela. And she has this look like, whoa, like, don't say my name like that. She doesn't say anything, but she gives him that look and kind of steps back like, okay, Ixnay on the letting person know who I am. People know who I am. And the senator says, oh, I forgot. We're not supposed to let people know who you are. And Angela gives him that look like, hmm interesting and he says oh i just want to thank you and she says for what and he says oh for saving my life you know that was very courageous of you and because of you i'm here and she tells him you know try not to get kidnapped next time and he lets her know i'll try not to and he goes into the elevator and that scene is very suspicious and first of all why he was there and two, why is he letting the cat out the bag of her identity? She brushes that off and she goes to her other office officers and she says, have you seen any vigilantes that wear a belt like this? And one officer says, well, no. And what is this? What is this crap all on the belt? And she says, it's oil. This person was watching me and when I proceeded to chase him, they sprayed themselves down with oil and slid down into the sewer. And he tells her, well, um, Sister Knight, you know, I really don't know what this is. And I haven't heard anything about this vigilante dressing like this or acting like this. Did the vigilante have a Rorschach mask on? Angela's like, no. Well, was he walking around saying, tick tock, tick tock? Angela's just like, well, no. And he says, well, I really don't think we should go to our new boss with this. So unless you have more information on Mr. Lube, there's no reason why I should report this. And she says, our new boss. So she walks to the office where Chief Judd used to be, and she sees that it is the agent from the FBI. And she says, oh, Angela, hi, welcome. And Angela is very confused, like, oh, are you our new boss? And she says, in the meantime, as we're still looking at information, but come in. And Angela comes in and stands a few feet away from her desk because she doesn't know what to make of this situation. Agent Blake tells Angela, you know, after that car situation, I sent it to get dusted for prints. And it's just very interesting, the things that I've learned from that. You know, I know you got your family and, you know, uh, and friends, but you don't seem like the type to have a lot of friends, but I noticed that there were different prints on there, and it comes back to somebody named William Reeves. 
and did a little digging about that. And in the 1940s and 50s, he was a cop in New York City. And Angela says, a cop? Really? And Agent Blake, she says, well, you don't know who this is? Oh, that's interesting. If I do the math, somebody that was a cop in the 40s and 50s and Today, that would make them about 100 plus years old. And you know how old people get around? Wheelchairs. Yeah. And remember, Agent Blake, she noticed that at the crime scene, that there were wheelchair tracks. So Agent Blake, she's letting Angela know, I'm finding out this information, so try not to play me for a fool. Petey walks in to tell Agent Blake that they have some more information about the car. And Agent Blake says, wow, Angela, it's just perfect timing that we have more follow-up concerning your vehicle. And why don't you come along? So now we have Petey, Agent Blake, and Angela, Sister Knight, all in the car, driving to this location with more information that they've had, uh, that they've received concerning the car. And Angela says, you know, I'm really concerned about what the FBI cares about my little poor little car and why are you doing so much research about the car? And Agent Blake says, you know, I just find it very interesting that your car came up missing after the murder. And not only that, your history, you know, um, that you and your husband, you met in Vietnam. And what about your parents? Where are they? And Angela says, you know, both of my parents died when I was really young. And Agent Blake says, oh, an orphan. Okay. An orphan running around with a mask. And all the research that I've done, people that go around with masks on usually have this kind of curriculum and this mission to hide their feelings and who they are. And Angela says, I wear the mask to hide who I am for my protection. And Agent Blake says, oh, yeah. Hmm. Your protection okay yeah well you know just to let you know the FBI we are categorizing the disappearance of your car as a thorough dynamic incident and Angela says well what the heck is that and the agent says well, you know it's just this smart way of us saying that it's all connected man in other words we're not naive to things mysteriously happening and you don't have to be so secretive about who you are or what you are, what you've been doing or what you're hiding because, you know, we all have a history. Matter of fact, Petey, why don't you let Sister Knight know my history and who I am because we don't, like, you know, we don't hold any secrets. And Petey goes on to explain, well, you know, Agent Blake's parents, you know, are the comedian, comedian and um, Sulk um, Spectre. And they're from that TV show, Minutemen, which is not historically accurate. But make a long story short, her father tried to rape her mother. And it's this silence that happens in the car. And Angela gives her that look like, hmm, you got some history too. And as they pull up, they're starting to see the millennium clock as they stop. And Angela, this is her first opportunity to see it up close and personal. We got Petey, Sister Knight, and Agent Blake. They go into the inside to speak to the employees because Agent Blake wants to know who has authority over what devices. And they see that it's flying devices that are on the inside. And she asked an employee, I want to know the names of who has permission to fly these devices and when they had them. Because, you know, does this apparatus have the potential to maybe pick up a car and drop it somewhere? And the employee says, well, why would anybody want to do that? And then we hear this little distinctive voice saying, I'll take it from here. And it's this very short Asian girl, very quaintly dressed. And she says, well, hello, I'm Bian. And I'll handle any further questions that you may have. Usually my mother would assign somebody to answer these particular questions and maybe speak to people who are of authority. But my mother, she actually wants to have tea time with you and speak with you directly. And if you follow me, I'll show you the way. And they all begin to follow her. And Agent Blake says, you know, what is this place 
actually? You know, is it the new wonder of the world? Is it the eighth wonder of the world? And Bian says, no. It's the first wonder of the world, of the new world. And everybody's kind of quiet and trying to figure out what the heck she's talking about. As they walk further, Bian tells Petey, I'm sorry, but females only. And they proceed to go further and they walk into the area where Lady True is sitting. And Lady True says, well, hello, Agent Blake and Angela. So she lets them know, I know who you are. And she says, pardon the humidity. I told my mother that I would never leave Vietnam and instead I brought Vietnam to me. I had to make sure that the plants were just right. Agent Blake then says, oh, well, you know, Sister Knight grew up in Vietnam. And Lady True says, oh, is that right? Well, I know why you're here and you want information and you want a list of names of people who could maybe operate that apparatus and maybe times and all of that. So I've prepared a list for you of those names. And we see beyond hand Agent Blake that list and it's already prepared and she hands it to her. And Angela has that look like, how did they know what we wanted? And how is it that they have a list already prepared with the name? So Angela is peeping the game and how weird this situation is. And Lady True then goes on to say to Angela, I heard about your chief and I send my condolences. It's a shame. I heard he was a very nice person person and Angela nods her head and says well thank you and she says you know there are things in Vietnam that we used to say to console people who are going through a rough time and she proceeds to talk in and to Angela in Vietnamese but she says your grandfather wants to know you know where are his pills and Angela looks back at her and gets very deep eye contact and says if the old mother effer wants his pills, then he needs to come to me. And Lady True goes back to English and says, no, I've never heard of that quote, but that's very nice. <laughs> like, dang. So we know that Angela speaks Vietnamese and she know how to do a little something, something. So as they had that conversation, Agent Blake goes, is that Adrian V? Like she sees this statue of him there. And Lady True says, yes, I look up to him and he's, you know, kind of this beacon of how I work. And she says, yeah, because you bought his company after he disappeared. And she says, well, what I don't understand about the statue is that why did you get it made? And he looks old. And we see the statue, but it's Adrian in his current form. So we know clearly that Lady True knows his current form. And she's seen his current form. Because it's a statue that looks just like him in the form that we saw in the last episode when he was in his full uniform, in his full uh, disguise, per se. And she says, well, no, you know, Vietnamese character, you know, uh, culture, excuse me. She says, you know, we like to have people that we look up to in an older statue. It's, it's a form of respect. Adrian, he's at this lake and we think that he's fishing for fish. But in actuality, we see that he's fishing for babies. There are different types of these little gel like babies that he gets from the water and he's looking through it and seeing which one he wants. He's even tossing some back into the lake and he picks a few that he likes. He then goes back home and he places his, places the babies that he's picked in this chamber. And when he puts them in the chamber, he releases this lever and he starts the record player. And as he starts the record player, we see that the record player music has been put on to drown out the screams and the cries of whatever is going on with these babies. And you think, what could be going on? What is happening? But you kind of have an idea that, oh, this is how he's getting his clones. And as the camera pans back out, we see that the chamber now inside are fully grown and ad 
uh, developed adults who are the clones that we've seen throughout these past episodes. And he gets them out and he dresses them and he lets them know, I am your master. You may not know your assignment or exactly what you're doing, but I'll tell you what to do. And we see that it is this room full of deceased clones. Either he was dissatisfied with and deceased and killed and he got rid of those. And he takes the clones that he just got outside to go to the machine that we've seen him, that he's been working on for the past couple of episodes. And he places the deceased clones into this lever. And he says, lever up. And he the lever goes and flings the clones far, far into the distance. And as we look, we can see that the clone goes far into the distance. And then all of a sudden, their bodies disappear. They're not falling down. They're vanishing into nothingness. So we can see that there is some type of field that's preventing Adrian from escaping or getting out of this area that he's in. Once he sees that this body doesn't go any further, he then makes a note in his notepad and saying, well, we got to change the setting. So they changed the setting on the machine and we can see that with this new setting, it has made the clone go even further out and higher. And he goes with his telescope and he looks out. He still sees that the clone is vanishing into nothingness. And he says, four years. Four years ago it's been since I've been placed here and I thought this place was wonderful and I thought it was a paradise but in actuality it's a prison and I'll figure out how to get out of here. So that confirms that he's running this test catapulting these clones to see how far he needs to go and how high he needs to go to get around this force field or this mechanism that is preventing him from escaping this area. Angela gets back home and by the time she gets back home, it's late, it's dark, all the children are asleep, but she sees that Cal is up and he's reading a book. And she says, well, we need to have a little argument and I'm trying to pick an argument out of you. In other words, we need to talk. And she says, well, why didn't you tell me that that FBI agent came over here to talk to you? And he says, well, you know, the agent came by and she wanted to know who was the person that called you the night that Judd was killed. So I told her we were having sex in a closet. And then all of a sudden you received this phone call from, you know, your grandfather and it's disappointing to me because I never knew you had a grandfather. You didn't tell me that. And I told her that you left. And I didn't even see you until the next morning. So that's what I told her. And Angela says, you didn't tell her that. You told her something else. And you lied. And I know you did because you're tired of lying. And Cal says, right. You know I didn't tell her that. I just really think that this agent wants to help you. And Angela says, you know, you might be right. I don't know. But meet me in the closet. The final scene, BM, she's awakened in her bed by having a nightmare. And she gets herself together and she's breathing heavily because it's been clearly a very bad nightmare that she's had. And she puts on her glasses and we notice that she takes out an IV that is the same company that her mother owns, right? And that also is the same company that owns the telephone booth that Agent Blake always uses. But she gets up and she walks down the hall and she calls for her mother. And Lady True says, yes. And she tells her, I had a very bad dream. I had a dream that I was in this village and men, they, they burned it. And they made us walk. And we walked and walked. And mom, we walked so far. And as she's telling her this, Lady True has this look off into the distance as if the story is familiar to her. And she says, mom, we just walked and walked and walked. And you know what? My feet, they actually still hurt. And Lady True looks at her daughter and says, good. 
And BM says, Mom, will you walk me back to my room? And Lady True says, no, my love. She says, well, okay. Well, I'll head back to bed. And as she proceeds to get up and walk to her room, she says, good night, Mr. Reeves. And we see that it's Will. And he's sitting in his seat and he says, well, good, good night. And, good, you know, go, go back to bed. Good night. And we're thinking, what? It's Will? <laughs> so then Lady True, she joins him at the table. And she says, these pills that you asked for, you know, do you really need those? And he's just like, I just wanted to know where they were if she had them. I need them back. And he said, you know, I'm concerned. And Will says, well, why are you worried? She says, no, I'm concerned. And Will says, what's the difference? It's the same thing. And Lady True says, I'm just concerned because when family gets involved, thought processes and judgment Judgment start to get clouded. And I don't want that to mess up anything. That can mess up deals that we have. That can mess up plans. And he says, you know, that's understandable. And he gets up and proceeds to walk to another part of the room. And you're like, okay, well, he can walk. He's not bound to a wheelchair. And as he looks off into the distance and he says, you know, you want to know if I'm still in. And he asked her, how much time do we have? And Lady True says, three days. And he says, okay, three days. In three days, Angela, she'll know the truth. She'll know who I am. And, you know, Lady, Lady True says, well, why don't you just tell her who you are? What's up with all this waiting? And he says, well, the personality that she has, she won't believe me. She needs to experience and understand and find out the truth on her own. But you want to know if I'm in? I'm in. And in these three days, Angela, she'll find out the truth. She'll find out that I've betrayed her and her family. And she'll be upset about what I've done. But you want to know if I'm in? I'm in. And I'm in all the way. TikTok. TikTok. And that is the end of the episode. Once again, an amazing episode. I know in the comments uh, with the last episode, some people expressed that, oh my God, the series is going so slow. Oh, this is boring. And I, I don't understand how you find it boring because they are building up a crescendo for something that I believe will be a major payoff for the series. We have... Only nine episodes for season one, which I think is absolutely perfect. Like, oh my goodness, what a way to reel us in for a season two. I don't think that the director who gets a bad rep for Lost, because, you know, that just kept going and going. And you're like, what's up with the black phone? Who is, like, for real, tell me what's up. I'm sorry, I lost my voice. But... I really feel that they are building a crescendo that will have a major payoff. Um, people have their critiques about how it's going, but there's only so much information that they can give to us at a steady pace that makes sense. Not everybody has read the comic books. Not everyone has seen the movie. Keeping in mind, this series is taking place 30 to 34 years after the comic book series ends. So they are giving this hypothetical of the what ifs of what could happen after it was over. So it is this new journey and this new evolution that the audience is being brought into. So far, I haven't been disappointed. So far, I actually like the speed that they're going. You don't want it to go too fast. Because it would be nothing to look forward to. And I don't think it's going too slow. I think it's going at a very good pace. I still think that Cal, the character Cal, is working with the police in a bad way. I do think that he's on the wrong side of the fence when it comes to information. Uh, I do think that there, he's feeding someone information about Angela. Every time Angela comes home, it's okay to be, you know, a spouse and you're asking her whereabouts. Hey, where were you? And, you know, where have you been? That's normal. But when you start to ask very detailed, specific questions, it gives me 
the feeling that he's getting that information because somebody has told him, hey, find out when she went here, what did she say? And find out what here. I really feel that he's giving and he is a mole to the to the wrong side, giving information about Angela. Also, it was very suspicious how the senator just nonchalantly, just kind of just very sarcastically, when he saw Angela said, well, hello, Angela. And he said it loudly. He didn't say it quietly like, well, hello, Angela. Thank you for saving my life. He made it very known. Thank you. And he didn't try to hide it. Is he feeling some type of way? Does he know that she's found this uniform in the closet? We see that Agent Blake and Angela, that they're getting closer and closer together when it comes to instilling more trust into one another. Agent Blake is letting it known, hey, I was in a, in a costume at one time. I was a vigilante. I was in a mask, kind of putting it out there. Hey, girl, I know what's going on. I knew that you were Sister Knight. So we see that this dynamic is getting closer and closer. Uh, looking Glass, what side is he on? He didn't seem too surprised to learn that this KKK uniform was in their house. Uh, is it because that he's been there, done that, he doesn't trust anyone? Or is it because he doesn't know what side to be on? Um, they're giving us these Easter eggs everywhere of hints of how maybe the cast can split. And how they feel that who they're fighting for. Who are the patriarchs? Who are the heroes? Who are the true villains? Lady True is leaning on to Adrian's side. Is Adrian a good guy? Is he a bad guy? I love how it's making us think and develop our own conclusions. Each episode is a shocker. Each episode gives us more and more information. So I love it. Stay tuned for episode 5. Uh, once again, apologies. I lost my voice. If you follow me on Instagram, you know what's been going on for this past week. Um, I was in New York. As many of you know, I am developing as an actress and as an executive producer. So there was a lot of networking that I did um, while in New York. And a lot of the information is on there. But I lost my voice from so much talking <laughs> and excitement, yelling, yay, you know. Um, so just stay tuned. Let me know what you think. Um, subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet and I don't know if you noticed newbies but I subscribe to anyone who subscribes to me follow me on Instagram at the same profile name official bun underscore E stay tuned for episode 5 I'm very excited let me know what you think do you agree do you disagree let me know in the comments I do respond to everyone have a good one I'll see you in episode 5 coming up <laughs> bye <laughs>